Good evening, everyone. My Bible is open to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. We're starting every time, every lesson in Ephesians chapter four as we focus on growth. Think about growth and what that means. I am delighted to see you. Wonderful crowd for a Saturday night. There's a ton of great things you could be doing. College football. All sorts of things that you could be involved in, like watching football. And I'm really glad to see you here. You have chosen to serve the Lord, encourage the brethren, and draw closer to God through His Word. That just means a lot. And I would say this. Brother Sean told me good things about this church, and he did not lie. So encouraged by your warm reception of the Word of God last night. Just appreciate you in so many ways. And I am aware that the elders here are just doing a spectacular job. However, so last night I called the church the Monte Verde Church. <laughs> and so I did talk with the elders about if they could change the sign so that I would be right. And they don't seem to really want to do that, so I am praying for them. I just want to say that right now, but I'm glad to be at Monta Vista. And I'm looking forward to have an opportunity to get to know you better as we work in the Word of God together. Let's read. It's in Ephesians 4. This is in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. I'm in verse 15, where the Apostle Paul says, Ephesians 4 and 15, that rather... We are to speak the truth in love, so that we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so that it builds itself up in love. Growth is so important for us, and when we are growing, that's because, as we learned last night, God is at work in our lives and bringing us to Him, causing us to understand and be and become what we need to be in the image of His Son. But a huge part of that, a key factor in that is that you and I need to be involved in reading our Bible on a regular basis. And that is our focus tonight. We want to think about daily Bible reading. In some ways, that amounts to reading the directions. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe as you're looking at our schedule and the things, man, Brother Sean, you didn't get that screen moved, did you? I worked on this all day, and then when I went to the... I just gesture in the wrong direction. Maybe as you look at the screen there... You're thinking, I wish Mark had talked about growing in our marriage or how we can grow and be better parents. Maybe I'm not covering something that you would really like to have covered, but I would say to you that tonight we're going to cover an awful lot because we're going to talk about how to read God's directions. That's what Bible reading is all about. And although sometimes it's painful to admit, gentlemen, we do need every now and then, yes, to read the directions. Dana bought us some chairs from Ikea. You know what happens when you get chairs from Ikea? You get this box, you dump it out, looks like a bunch of tinker toys on the floor. Dana said, do you need to read the directions? And of course I said, absolutely not. I know what a chair looks like. I'll put this chair together. So I put the chairs together, no problem at all until the last step when I couldn't put the seat on because I'd installed the arms wrong and now the whole thing wouldn't go together, which time I asked Dean if she didn't need to go to the grocery store so she didn't see me have to take it all back apart. <laughs> should have read the directions. That's how I should have started and then I wouldn't have had all of those problems. And I wonder sometimes as we come to the Lord with questions, God, what am I going to do to act like and honor Jesus in my marriage? What could I do on the job so that I can be a loyal and trustworthy worker? What can I do with my children to help them come to know you and be your children? As we have all of these questions, I wonder sometimes if maybe what God would really like to do is thunder from above. I gave you a book. Have you read the directions? We need to think about that in terms of regular daily Bible reading because the Bible consistently over and over again talks about the power and importance of the written Word of God. So many places in the Word of God extol the value of Scripture. In the 19th Psalm, there's so much there about the power of creation to drive us to the Creator. But the back half of Psalm 19 talks about what? The law of the Lord is 
grace perfect. The longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119, is all about the power of the Word of God. And right here in Ephesians chapter 4, if you just step up to chapter 3, look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 5, verse 4 and 5. Paul says there, I want you to know the things of Christ and I want you to understand the things of Christ. How can you do that? Ephesians 3 verse 4, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The Bible is literally God's Word to you and me so that we can understand His mind, His will, and what we are to become. In fact, in 2 Timothy the third chapter, you can't talk about daily Bible reading without reading 2 Timothy 3, can you? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verses 16 and 17, Paul makes this enormous claim. In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, all Scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete. Some translations have mature. Want to be a mature Christian? Do you want to be complete? Able to function in every sphere of life where you serve God and honor Him? Do you want to grow into a fully grown up Christian, not a baby disciple, no, a powerful Christian who can influence others for Jesus. You want to do that? You need the Word of God. It will, verse 17 concludes, equip you for every good work. Yet the reality is we struggle with daily Bible reading. We really struggle to get in the Word on a regular basis and stay with it. One study found that only 16% of Christians read the Bible on a daily basis. 16%. The Bible is so easily accessible to us. You can buy Bibles anywhere and everywhere in any flavor, translation, color of cover, size of print that you want. Now the Bible is on our devices. We can literally be somewhere, anywhere, and have the capacity to access the Word of God. Yet still, only 16% of people reading their Bibles on a regular basis. Yet every study shows that if you want to look for the factor that correlates the highest with spiritual maturity and genuine commitment to Christ over the long haul, Bible reading always shows up as that dominant factor. People who read the Bible on a regular basis, those folks, they serve the Lord. They make it work. Because why? Because, because the Bible is growing them. When I'm in a gospel meeting effort like this, if I can get anywhere close to the subject of daily Bible reading, I am going to preach on daily Bible reading. I don't know, maybe I'm doing a series on evidences and they want me to preach on what's wrong with evolution and, and all kinds of creation things. I'm not sure how I'm going to get my daily Bible reading sermon in there, but I'm working on it because I want to talk with people about reading the Bible. And I was in a meeting and I got done talking about daily Bible reading. A fellow came up to me with tears in his eyes. He told me that he heard a similar sermon when he was a very young man in the early 70s, Jim Cope was preaching a lesson on the importance of regular daily Bible reading. He told me, he said, I decided that very night, I'm doing that. I am doing that. That is God's Word. That's what's going to make the difference. I'm going to try to read my Bible every day from now on. And he told me that with precious few exceptions, he had been able to keep that commitment. And I stepped back from him and saw all the people in the church surround him as they talk with him after services because he's a shepherd in that church. And his walk with God is strong and obvious and evident to everyone. The Word of God. God has worked in his life through his Word to grow him to be a powerful Christian. So I want to talk with you about doing exactly that. Making a commitment this evening. This is it. We're going in. We're doing this. We're going to keep doing this because we want to grow in God's Word so that we can grow 
closer to the Lord. I'm going to share with you tonight three important steps that you need to be about if you're going to be regular and consistent in your Bible reading. Are you ready? The first step, going to need to read the Bible with purpose. Step number one, we need to read the Bible with purpose. Why do people read the Bible on a daily basis? Some people are going to do that because it's kind of a bucket list deal. I've always wanted to run a marathon, I've always wanted to climb Mount Everest, I've always wanted to see the Texas Rangers win the World Series. Whoops, should not have said that. <laughs> always wanted to read my Bible through in a year. Going to do that, then I'm going to check that off. I want you to know that is not a great reason to read the Bible. We are not doing this on a one-time basis. Whew, finally got done with that. I'll move on to something else. We're talking about something like prayer in your life that we're always going to be about. I don't know anybody who brushes their teeth and says, well, done with that. Check that off the old bucket list. No, that's part of daily life. If it's not, please don't talk to me after services. We want to read our Bible on a regular basis for better than just, I'm going to brag about what I've done. And of course, some people are going to read their Bible because they want to get after their religious neighbor. So they're reading their Bible to find all kind of ammunition. They're loading up their KJV 47 and they're coming after people. I've got this verse for you. And there certainly is something to be said about being ready to give a defense for our faith. We talked a little bit about that last night. But of course, reading the Bible to apply it to everybody else, that's not what this is about, and that's not going to grow you. Maybe somebody says, I'm trying to read the Bible so that I can combat temptation. Now that's better, isn't it? That's better because that's what Jesus did in Luke 4. Jesus uses the Bible to repel the tempter. I think that's stronger and that's even better. But I'm going to show you what I believe is the best reason to read the Bible. Can you find in your Bible Jeremiah the ninth chapter? In Jeremiah chapter 9, let's look at the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah says this in Jeremiah 9 and verse 23. Jeremiah 9 and verse 23, the Word of God says here, the prophet speaking for God, thus says the Lord, Jeremiah 9, 23, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love and justice and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Please underline in your Bible, understands and knows me. That's a relationship verse. That verse is talking about having a relationship with God. We talk about that all the time, almost in a religious jargon kind of way. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you have a personal relationship with Christ? But many people have never really drilled down to figure out what that means. Jeremiah 9.24 is defining that. When we're in a relationship with somebody, we what? We understand them. We know them. We know what they like. We know what they do not like. We understand what they are interested in. We care about what they are interested in because we care about them. I want to say to you this evening, the reason we want to read our Bibles is because we want to come to know God. That's what this is all about. I want to know the Lord. What He loves, what He hates, what pleases Him, what displeases Him. What is His agenda? What is His priority? What does He want me to do? Why did He make me? I want to know and understand God. Notice that characteristics are given. Steadfast love and justice and righteousness. I want to know the Lord. In fact, this is emphasized over and over in the Bible. Look with me in the book of Judges, please, in Judges chapter 2. In Judges chapter 2, if you are familiar with the book of Judges, you know it is a dismal and dark book. God's people did not do what's right once they entered the land of Canaan. All kinds of crazy things happened. People did wickedness of every sort in every dimension. And yet Judges chapter 2 and verse 10 tells us why that happened. In Judges chapter 2 and verse 10, all that generation also were gathered to their fathers and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord 
or the work that he had done for Israel. Didn't care about God. Weren't interested in God. Didn't want to know what God liked, what God didn't like. Didn't have a relationship with God. In 1 Samuel, look in 1 Samuel chapter 2. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, we read here about Eli. And Eli's sons, they were rats. They were just terribly bad men. And so 1 Samuel tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 12, 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 12, the sons of Eli were worthless men. Told you they were rats. They were worthless men. Why were they worthless men? Look at 1 Samuel 2, 12. They did not know the Lord. Didn't care about God didn't have relationship with God. In the book of Galatians now, you want to see this in the New Testament? In Galatians the fourth chapter, please. Let's have Galatians 4 in this discussion. In Galatians the fourth chapter and in verse 8, when Paul talks about Christianity, he talks about it in relationship terms when he says this in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 8, formally you did not know God and you were enslaved to that by nature that are not God's. can't have a relationship with an idol. Idols don't care about you, can't have any kind of relationship. But now, he says, Galatians 4 verse 9, now you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God. But how can you turn back again to the weak and the worthless and the elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? Don't go back to idolatry. You can't have real relationship there. You know the Lord. The Lord knows you. Grow and strengthen and deepen that relationship. So maybe somebody says, I want to have a relationship with the Lord. How do you do that? Well, all relationships are built through communication. Through communication, we come to know someone, what they're like, what they're interested in. We come to trust them and we come to love them. It's exactly the same for God. We have a relationship with God based on communication. We speak to God, that's called yeah, that's called prayer. We pour out our hearts to God, tell God what's important to us, what's bothering us, areas that we want to grow in, what we're concerned about, what blessings that we're seeking, other people that we're concerned about. We pour our hearts out to God in prayer. We talk to God. And then God speaks to us through His Word. By the way, how many of us are just having a one-sided conversation? It's a monologue. We don't want to hear what God has to say. We sure do want God to tune in when we've got a prayer going on. No. Communication's a two-way street. We'll talk to the Lord in prayer. God's going to talk to us through His Word. When we read our Bible regularly, we come to see and know God. We begin to view the world through His eyes. We begin to see what He is interested in. We begin to see what He wants us to do. We begin to care about what He cares about. Our relationship with Him grows. We're coming to know Him. We're coming to trust Him. We're coming to love Him. Don't tell me this is unimportant. I'm working out of Jeremiah 9. That's a pretty obscure passage in the prophets, kind of in the back side of the Old Testament, a little dusty back there. But when somebody asked Jesus, what's the number one commandment? What did Jesus say? To know the Lord, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can't love what you don't know. And maybe what that says is, when we talk about daily Bible reading, someone will say, you know, haven't done my daily Bible reading today. What we really ought to say is, I haven't spent time with God today. I haven't spent time with the Lord. I've cared about a lot of other things, but I haven't cared to stop everything and spend some time hearing what God has to say. When we start viewing it in terms of relationship, watch how fast all the excuses that we use to get out of daily Bible reading just get crushed. Somebody says, you know, I'd love to do that daily Bible reading thing, Mark. It's so important. I get that. But, you know, I'm, I'm so busy. What happens in a marriage if somebody gets real busy maybe with their job? workaholic, working 90, 100 hours a week and they neglect their spouse. Does that relationship get strong? Does that relationship get good? No, that relationship begins to deteriorate and fall apart. You wonder why your relationship with God is stale? Why you feel flat spiritually? Are you spending time with God? The reality is 
Some of us have a better relationship with our digital device. Some of us have a better relationship with social media or maybe binge watching on Netflix, our favorite show. We spend hours and hours with Hollywood, hours and hours with these actors and actresses, but we don't have time. Don't have time for the Lord. What do we value? What's important to us? Are we going to spend time with God because I want to know the Lord? Someone says, well, Mark, you know, that Bible is so hard to understand. I, I like to read my Bible more, but I just don't know what, everything that's going on there. In some ways, I think our culture has just gotten lazier and lazier and lazier. We just want everything served up quick and easy. You ever do that thing where you're flipping around and there's just all infomercials on? Maybe it's late at night, you're watching TV and there's just infomercial. And most infomercials today are about what? Exercise equipment. We cannot have enough exercise equipment. Here's a guy and he's got a rubber band on his fingers and he's doing this. And he says, you know what? The Wubba Sizer, you do this for 25 seconds a day and you'll have six-pack abs. I'm watching that thinking, I got to order. I could do that while I eat donuts. That would just be amazing. We want everything to be quick and easy. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 with me. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, I understand that there are places in the Word of God that will require, dare I say it, some actual thought. And from time to time, we might have to do some study. But I'm looking at 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, where Paul says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. These terms, do your best, that term is a word that means to strive, to work hard, to make an effort. And notice he says you need to be a worker. Relationships, relationships take work. You can't just put the thing on autopilot. It won't work if you do that. Is working at our relationship with God worth it? Absolutely. I know that there's a lot of different translations out there, but I want you to know, you can't buy the new microwave version. You just pop that thing in for 25 seconds and you're going to have this great relationship with God. That will not happen. If you want to know the Lord, you've got to put in the time. Make the effort. And someone says, well, Mark, you know, I've read a bunch of that Bible and kind of know if I, if I need to know something, I, I'll just Google it up. I'm aware, you're aware, that we live in an information age where if we need factoids, they're always at our fingertips. They're always as close as our digital device. But I want you to understand this evening that our goal, our desire as we grow in daily Bible reading is not to amass more information the goal of Bible reading is not just to learn stuff. The goal of Bible reading is not really information. The goal of Bible reading is transformation, that we might know God. And instead of being self-centered and about our own kingdom and our own agenda, that we would discard all of that and lay it aside because as we come to know God, we want to please and honor and glorify Him. That's what this is about. And I am fully aware that as we read through the Bible, the information does not change. You are not ever reading 1 Samuel 17 and David walks out there and Goliath says, I got this and kills him. Whoa! I did not see that coming. I thought David will. Well, this time Goliath got him. Nope, nope, absolutely not. The information never changes. But can I say this to you? You change. Your life and who you are and what you've experienced, that changes. About 30-something years ago, I was in a hospital room and a nurse handed me a little pink bundle and said, Congratulations, you're a daddy. It was a great moment. A couple of years later, I repeated that experience, got that second pink bundle. Both of those times, I remember reading my Bible later in the day and reading about my heavenly Father. I'd read those verses a zillion times. But now I was a father. And all that feeling that I had for those helpless daughters, those little girls in my arms, I thought about how protected I want to be of them and all my hopes and dreams for them and that I would do anything for them. And suddenly I read that word, Father, and I realized God feels like that about me. He's my Father. 
felt weak in the knees to realize that. What happened there? Did the Bible change? No! Those words had been in the Bible since they were written down by the pen of the Holy Spirit. What happened? I changed. Now the Bible transformed me so that I could have a deeper and better relationship with God. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're all about. We want to come to know God. That is the first key. We're going to sit down and spend time with the Lord. And I should say this. Would you look at 2 Peter chapter 3? In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Please notice there, 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. None of this happens overnight. The metaphor in 2 Peter 3 and verse 18 is not electricity. It is not traveling at 186,000 miles a second. The metaphor, verse 18, grow, 2 Peter 3, 18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grow takes time. Nobody plants blueberry seeds and expects to have blueberries on their cereal the next morning for breakfast. Well, nobody does except, except Christians. They think they're going to read six verses of the passage and... Next morning, I'm supposed to have this amazing relationship with God. It's not going to work that way. It's not going to work that way at all because that's not how growth works. Remember when you were a little kid, your mama decided they're going, she's going to measure you against the closet door or the pantry door. She put that ruler on your head and make a little mark. Remember that? And here, you'd get to play and then in a minute, you'd run back and say, Mama, measure me again. She'd put you up against the wall. And, no, no, hadn't, hadn't, hadn't grown any at all. But you'd get busy doing other things and, some time would go by. One day your mom would say, Hey, come here, I want to measure you. What? Didn't even realize that I was growing. And as we regularly and repeatedly and consistently and systematically spend time in the Word of God, we grow spiritually. That's why we want to keep at it. That's why we need key number two, to read the Bible right. We want to do it regularly, consistently, and systematically. Now there's a couple things about that. We're going to start with a good quality Bible with a good quality translation. We're not interested in a paraphrase. There may be some places for some of that. But we want a Bible that is literal and accurate as best it can be. And can I just say this? If you're reading the King James Bible and you understand all that Shakespearean English, God bless you. But you know the rest of us, we just don't. Nobody talks that way anymore. Nobody goes into McDonald's and says, Whither hath the Ephrath and a burgereth? That is not how people talk today. You reading the King James Bible, you're spending half your time trying to figure out what the vocabulary is. Get you a quality Bible, New American Standard, English Standard, New King James maybe. These are good quality Bibles that you can read and that you can understand. Good Bible, time in prayer. Time in prayer. We open the Word of God. We start by asking God to bless this time as we read His Word. And we need to set aside a specific time. A specific time when we're going to do this. I'm going to do this first thing in the morning before I check social media. Before I do anything else, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to do this on my lunch hour. Every day I'm going to read on. You need to have a specific time. In a study that was done, some scientists had a group that was asked to exercise. Exercise is hard. Once in the next week. 29% of those people did. Then another group was given the, some information on the importance of exercise. 39% of those did. But the third group was asked to commit to exercising at a specific place, at a specific day, at a specific time. 91% of them did. 91% of them did. And as I'm saying this, I need you to think about what am I going to take out of my life so I can put Bible reading into my life. If your life is crowded, something's going to give. Can't just shove it in. You don't get 24 and a half hours now. We're all getting the same time. Arizona gets extra time. Do you get extra time here because you don't do daylight savings time? That is amazing. I'm kind of excited about not doing daylight savings time tonight. I'm kind of in on that. So we need to know when we're going to do it. we got a Bible so that we can do it. We need to have a Bible reading plan. 
We're not doing this thing where one day we're reading in Leviticus, next day we're reading in Revelation, next day we're reading in Mark, next day we're reading in Genesis. We close our Bibles, oh, I just don't understand any of this. That's not going to work. Not going to be regular. Not going to be systematic. But here's the most important part. Are you ready? Look at Psalm 1. Look at Psalm 1 with me. This is the most important part of daily Bible reading. This is for so many Christians the missing link. Oh, Dina. Right there in my evidences series, I can put daily Bible reading. It's the missing link. I'm doing that. Look at Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1, blessed is the man, Psalm 1, 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked or stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Listen to him now. On his law he meditates day and night. There it is, there it is, there it is. When we read the Word of God... We need to take the Word of God into our hearts. We need to meditate on it. Now please let go of any notions from the Near East, and the ancient, ancient Far Eastern religions where people cross their legs and hum and all of that. That's not what meditation means in the Bible. In the Bible, meditation is to consider, to think over, to think about, to understand and to consider the ramifications and implications of what I've just read. The man who's blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. He thinks about it. He considers the Word of God. God's Word has tremendous power. But that power is not coming into your life just automatically. Step one, you got to read it. you got to read it. But step two, which is missing in so many Christians' lives, then you got to think about it. You have to consider the Word. If all we do is get out of our Bible reading schedule, oh, okay, I'm reading these 15 verses. Read those 15 verses, check, slam the Bible shut, and go on about our business. Guess what's going to happen? It's not going to be transformational. It is not going to grow your relationship with God. After a while, you're going to say, I don't even know why I'm doing this. I, I'm just checking off those boxes left and right. I get my reading done every day. But it's not changing me. The Word feels barren and powerless. We are not coming to know God. We are not growing deeper in our relationship with God. And it's because we're not considering God. God's Word. We're not thinking about what it means for my life. We're not thinking about how I can live what I just read. We're not thinking about the God who wrote that. In fact, if you have 20 minutes to read your Bible, you're going to do that on your lunch hour, you're going to do that first thing in the morning, you're going to do that right before you go to bed. If you've got 20 minutes, I would suggest that you read for 15 and meditate on the Word for 5. Make sure you're thinking about the Word. And when we're thinking about the Word, don't think about all kinds of geographic details. Don't think about all kinds of logistical details. How many camels did Solomon have? That's not going to grow your relationship with the Lord. What do you think about? You think about God. Why did God write this here? What's God saying here? How does God feel in this text? That's one of the most powerful questions you can ask. And somebody will think, oh, wow, I don't know. Can we ask how God feels? God's always telling us how He feels. God will be angry. You can tell when God is angry in the Bible. God is excited and delighted that His people are obeying Him. You can tell when the Lord is delighting in His people. What does God think about this? What is this person in the text doing that pleases God? What is this person doing in the text that displeases God? How can I be like that? How can I stop being like that? What does God want to say in this text? That's what we're doing. We are considering the Word of God. What can I do here to better my relationship with the Lord? That's the key step so many are missing. And I would say to you, I do not believe that the Lord speaks in a still small voice in people's ears. But hear me well. I do believe the Lord speaks. That He is speaking through the sacred page, the power of inspired Scripture. And in fact, I would say this, I believe the Scripture is so powerful that God doesn't need to speak in your ear because God has spoken. What we need to do is train our ears, train our hearts to hear what God has said. Over and over God is saying, read the directions. 
I want to know you and I want you to know me. So I gave you this book. It tells you all about me. Read to know me. Consider the Word. Now as we're talking about that, in many ways that's a very unusual way to read the Bible. Very different kind of thinking. Sometimes our reading of the Bible gets very fact-based. We are mapping stuff out. There's room for that. Sometimes it's heavy-duty study. We've got a bunch of commentaries out and language works. and You know, it's 18 hours of like writing a term paper. And there's a place for that kind of study too. Or maybe we're studying to get ready to teach Bible class. But I'm just talking about the reading you're doing personally on a regular, consistent, systematic basis, stopping everything and saying, I'm going to spend some time with God. I get done with this reading, I want to know the Lord better. Let me give you a tool that will help you in doing that. This is a tool that I have shared many, many times in many, many places that has proved helpful for lots and lots of people. I call this the PATH tool. Normally at Westside, where I work and labor in the DFW area, usually our congregational reading plan calls for us to read about a chapter a day, five days a week. That's a very doable plan. The New Testament has 250 chapters in it. You read a chapter a week, a chapter a day, five days a week. You can read the whole New Testament in a year. No problem. Some of the chapters in the New Testament, I mean, they're so short you can read them at a stop sign. It's just not that hard to read the New Testament in a year. But once you've done your 15 minutes of reading, what are you going to do with that reading to get to know God better? Well, what you can do is path the chapter. And what does that stand for? The first thing that we're going to do when we do any kind of Bible, we read one verse, reading 50 verses. We're going to look for something here where I can praise God. Look what God does. Look how amazing God is. Look how awesome God is. What in this text causes me to say, God, you're incredible. Then I'm going to look for something in the text that admonishes me. I'm not thinking about my wife, not thinking about my neighbor, not thinking about somebody else at church. I'm thinking about me. What does this text say? Mark, you need to straighten this up. God's not tolerating that. Oh, that's never going to go. Get this fixed. I need something that admonishes me. And then, thirdly, I'm looking for something that builds trust. Trust is the gasoline and the engine of relationships. And in fact, Romans 10 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you want more trust in God, what do you need to do? You need to read your Bible more. And when you read your Bible, what you need to do is you start looking for places where God makes promises. Because God makes promises to everybody all the time, everywhere in Scripture. And guess what He does with all of those promises? How many of those promises does He keep? Half of them? 75%? Oh, come on. You know the answer to that. God keeps His Word every single time. Even when I'm reading it and thinking, Oh, I don't know about that. That woman's too old to have a baby. What are you doing, God, telling Sarah she's going to have a baby? God, God, no! Yes, God keeps His word. God, you told those Israelites they're going to get the land of Canaan? They have forts. They have armies. There's no... Oh, well, yeah, they got the land of Canaan, didn't they? God, you're going to send your son to take care of my sin problem? I mean, I'm a sinner. How can someone like me be made holy before you? Here comes Jesus. When you read the Bible and start looking for the things that God commits to and promises, over and over again, God keeps His Word. And what does that do? That builds our trust, our faith in God. And then, of course, finally, as I'm connecting a little bit to last night's lesson, I just look for things that give me hope. Things that give me hope that help me see the sovereignty and power of God or help me to see maybe people who stumbled and fell and... God didn't give up on them. God kept trying. God kept working with them. God kept bringing them along. I just look for something that says, hey, look at that. I can do it. If that person did it, I can do it too. That gives me hope. That path tool is extremely helpful because it gives us a mechanism by which we can come to know the Lord. You want to do it? You want to try it? Let's just try it, okay? Look with me in the book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 25, and we'll just work through this for just a minute, and I'll show you how I would do this in my own life. The reason I'm turning my Bible to Ezekiel the 25th chapter is because at West Side we are reading the prophets this year. And Ezekiel 25 was our reading on Friday. So I'm turning here to show you that I don't have some passage stuck in my back pocket that just magically aligns with this, and it's just so incredible. But when you go read a passage, you're like, I have no idea how to do this. I'm working out of the passage we read Friday. 
I'm going to read a couple of verses of this. This is the prophecy against Ammon in the first seven verses. Let's just read that together. The word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel 25, 1. Son of man, set your face toward the Ammonites and prophesy against them. Say to the Ammonites, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God, because you've said, Aha, over my sanctuary when it was profaned, and over the land of Israel when it was made desolate, and over the house of Judah when they went into exile. Therefore, behold, I'm handing you over to the people of the east for a possession. They shall set their encampment among you and make their dwellings in your midst. They shall eat your fruit. They shall drink your milk. I will make Rabbah a pasture for camels and Ammon a fold for flocks. And then you will know that I am the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, because you clapped your hands and stamped your feet, and rejoiced with all malice within your soul against the land of Israel. Therefore, behold, I have stretched out my hand against you and will hand you over as a plunder to the nations. I will cut you off from all the peoples. I will make you perish out of the countries. I will destroy you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I'm just going to stop right there. I'm not going to do the whole chapter. I'll just path those eight verses. You want to do that? So what about finding something to praise God about? Well, how about the fact that God punishes sin? The Ammonites are evil and wicked. They've harmed God's people. You know what? God needs to say, well, you know, that's kind of how that goes. God says, I'll take care of that. I'm going to see justice done. Aren't you glad for that? It drives me crazy when they come on the news and tell me that some murderer got released because they misspelled his name on an arrest warrant. We see somebody that we just know is guilty and they hired some big fancy Philadelphia lawyer and they got off. We think, oh, they got off. No, they didn't. They got off for now. Praise God. Justice will be done. And Ezekiel 25 verses 1 to 8 reminds us of that as God brings justice on the Ammonites. Now what here would admonish me? Well, I'm thinking a little bit about this business in verse 2 that you said, Aha, over my sanctuary when it was profaned and over the land of Israel when it was made desolate. They cheered on the enemies of God's people. In fact, verse 6 says, You've clapped your hands and stamped your feet and rejoiced with all malice within your soul against the land of Israel. I'm learning right there. I'll tell you what, I don't want to stand with the enemies of God's people. I don't want to stand with those who are cheering on the destruction of righteousness. If I do that, I'm standing against God. I'm being an Ammonite. Better make sure I stand with God's people. Sometimes when you stand around God's people, they'll be, they'll be saying hard things about other Christians. Boy, did you see her? I can't believe she'd come to church. Oh, did you see? Did you hear what he did? Did you see what he posted on social media? Snipe, 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 snipe. Sound like Ammonites, don't we? Attacking the people of God. Ezekiel 25 says, that's not what God approves of. God doesn't have any of that. I'm admonished by that. Don't want to be an Ammonite. What about trust? Yeah, that's pretty easy. God said to the Ammonites, I'm going to destroy you. 581, the Babylonians showed up and destroyed them. A bunch of those Ammonites didn't think that was going to happen. It did. You've never met an Ammonite, have you? They were destroyed exactly as God said they would. Then finally here, what about hope? What about hope? What I'm impressed with is that God cared about the Ammonite people. Even though they were wicked and doing wrong, he had a prophet to warn them so that they would, what, verse 5? Know that I'm the Lord. That matters, doesn't it? By the way, the prophet Ezekiel uses that expression more than 60 times. It's pretty important that people know God, isn't it? God wanted even Ammonites to know Him. That's impressive to me. And it reminds me that anybody that I meet, whether I meet somebody who's brown, black, white, yellow, purple, or plaid, doesn't make any difference. God cares about everybody. Ammonites, Moabites, Jewishites, it doesn't matter. The Lord loves all people, and I need to show that in my life, and I'm thankful for that. I'm a big old Gentile. I wasn't born a Jew, family of Abraham and all of that. It's amazing to me. God loves me too. God loved the Ammonites enough to send them a warning. I know that He loves me. That just gives me all kinds of hope. So there you go. Eight verses of a prophecy to Ammon. That seems so long ago and not relevant. It was really relevant, wasn't it? It helped us know God better. We just need to spend a little time and think about the Lord as we consider the Word. Which brings me then to the third and final key. In many ways, this is probably the most important part of this. When the preacher comes and he talks about daily Bible reading, we're going to get fired up about that. Maybe on January 1, Sean's going to pass out that Bible reading schedule. That's it! 
We're going for it. It's going to be great. We're excited. We read our Bible. We read our Bible the next day. We're passing some chapters. We read our Bible the next day. Then what happens on the next day? Oh, yeah. Washing machine catches on fire. The toilet overflows. The cat throws up on the rug, which is why you shouldn't have cats. They're evil. All kinds of <laughs> terrible things happen. Wow. It was worse last night when you weren't here to make me behave, Dina. I'll tell you. All kinds of things happen. You know what happens? Life happens. We're going to climb in bed and all of a sudden, Ooh! I didn't spend time with God today. What are we going to do about that? Well, we may just have to get out of bed and spend some time with God right then and there. Or it may be that we're just so weary and so tired that we just can't really have quality time with the Lord. It's just not going to work because we're just fatigued. And what we're going to have to say is, Lord, I, I just blew it. Things got busy and I didn't arrange my schedule right. And, I'm going to repent of that and I'm going to do better tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow, Lord. I'm going to be in your word. I want to know you better. Most important part of all that, though, is to always be mindful. We are not going to play the catch-up game. What happens when people get behind in their daily Bible reading schedule is they get behind one day and get behind another day, another day. Next thing you know, they're behind a lot of chapters. And before they can read today's reading, they feel like they need to get all that stuff that they've missed. Listen, if you miss and don't brush your teeth one day, you feel like you've got to brush them twice as much the next day? No, you just brush your teeth. Just, just take care of that. If you didn't pray one day, you feel like you've got to pray twice as long the next day? In Bible reading, don't worry about what you missed. Don't let that be a barrier to you that's going to keep you from doing today's reading. If in the reading schedule that you decide to adopt, let's just say a lot of crazy things happen in your life. Let's say you only read 50% of the readings in the year. Would that be more Bible reading than you've read before? Would you know God better if you spent time with Him and passed those chapters, thought about the Lord and grew your relationship? Yes, you would. We'd love to read it all. We're going to try to read it all. But if we can't read it all, we're going to read what we need to read today because we want that consistent habit. And I would say this. Nothing helps consistency more than telling yourself, I'll never miss two days in a row. You miss one day, you got that feeling, oh, I wish I hadn't happened. When you miss that second day, now that habit starts to erode. Now it gets easier to miss the third day and the fourth day and to hang it up. Never miss two days in a row. You miss one, hey, I'm going to repent of that and move on. Don't let it happen again. Spend time with the Lord. Now I want to say this. This is a very different way of looking. Hey, look at that, Sean. I gestured with the right hand. I feel like Vanna White. This is an important and different way of thinking about daily Bible reading. But I want you to understand, if you sit down with God's Word and you say to the Lord, I want to get to know you, I want to be in a relationship with you, I want to care about you, I want to love and trust you, God will answer that prayer. God will be at work in your life through His Word in a way far beyond anything that you could ever begin to imagine. There is not anything that will transform your discipleship like regular, consistent, systematic time reading the Word to know God. A couple of years ago, at about this time of year, I always ask the congregation, if you have a tip or an idea that made Bible reading better for you, come share that with me so as we begin the new year, I can share that with everybody. and It'll help people do better in their daily Bible reading. One dear sister came and she gave me this note. She said, I had a very difficult year this year. I was in a very bad situation in many mornings. The only thing I had to look forward to was reading my Bible. Each time I read, I was overwhelmed by how powerful God is and how weak our enemies actually are. But it was something I had to be reminded of on a daily basis. I actually craved His Word just so I could remember there was something better for me and not what I was going through every day. That's it. That is it. She came to know God. He came to work in her life to sustain her, to energize her, to care for her, to walk her through the valley of the shadow of death, to meet every need she had as she came to know Him through His Word. Who doesn't want that? I hope for you tonight that this is that moment where you will say, I'm in. This is that turning point that someday you'll look back on and say, 
that Saturday night, I came to understand how to read the Bible, got a tool to read the Bible, and committed to the habit of regularly reading God's Word. And now, I see how much I've grown because I read the Bible. Let's pray about it. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, Lord, our God, we're so thankful for Your Word. We'd be lost without it. We would not know You. We would not understand Your heart for us, Your care for us, Your desire to redeem us. We pray, Father, that You will help us to follow through on the commitments that we would make this hour. That we will be steadfast in our determination to know You better through Your Word. Bless our efforts, Father, to seek You through the pages of Scripture. We want to trust you and love you and please you. Help us, Father, to know you as we read your word. In Christ we pray, and amen. You've just listened so carefully tonight. Thank you so very, very much. This is so crucially important, and I appreciate you giving me your time to think and talk about this critical issue. As we conclude this evening... As you read the Bible, you will find that it is not hard to figure out how to be a Christian. That following Christ takes place as faith occurs in our life, as we turn away from a sinful life, a self-directed life that's called repentance, and as we give ourselves to Jesus Christ in loyal commitment for the forgiveness of our sins, that's called baptism. That happens in the baptistry when we are immersed into Christ Jesus to walk in newness of life, washed in the blood of the Lamb. You could do that this evening. I should tell you, if you're not going to obey God, you don't want to have any part of that book. Every page of it will eat you alive as God calls you to do as He says. If you are here tonight, you're a Christian, but you're not making a good job of it, you need to turn back to Him, and you know that, and the Lord knows that, and we'd love to help you repent and stand with God once again. Can we help you Know God by beginning your relationship in Jesus Christ as you're baptized into Him or by strengthening your relationship with Jesus Christ as you turn away from sin. Can we help you know the Lord? Make your way down front while we stand, while we sing.